This video is sponsored by Ren. This weekend, come down to the Free Hee Hee Spee Hee Hee Comedy Club, where nothing's off limits. Man, me and the comics love this place, man. It's not about censorship, no woke agenda, just pure funny. With no restrictions, I'm free to be as funny as I want. And I want to be real funny. You know, I got the question, you know, what the, what's going on with peanuts? Well, how can I open up a peanut? I was thinking I got two peanuts. What is this, a two for one deal? <clears throat> what is this, buy one, get one free? What, I bring in the coupon for extra peanut inside every specially marked peanut? Okay, not a peanut crowd. We're on stage philosophers. If Aristotle were alive today, he would be me. And meanwhile, you got Anthony Fauci, and he's like, what do you mean I sound like a turkey? <laughs> gobble, gobble, gobble. Happy Thanksgiving. Happy Thanksgiving again. It's a new Thanksgiving every day. Gobble, gobble, gobble. Well, you gotta get this guy in the trailer. This is the most free speech style comedy I've ever seen. Every time he gets on stage, you know he's about to make half the audience just full on, full out leave. Okay? It's, uh, it's what comedy's all about, really. Wait, wait. You do comedy? No, I'm not joking, I'm serious. Everyone should be white. The Free Speech Comedy Club, proudly sponsored by the Mises Institute. Oh, just kidding. That was not a real ad. But this is. Ah, nature! Who doesn't love the great outdoors? Let's take it in. <laughs> Nothing better than the great outdoors, but did you know that the Earth is under attack? Carbon dioxide, or CO2, is going up into the sky and stopping heat from leaving in of the atmosphere. I'm not really sure how it works, but what I get is that carbon is the thing that's killing us all. So you'd think there'd be an easy solution, right? Just get rid of all the things that are emitting carbon. But that's the problem, because the things that are emitting carbon are me and you, but mostly rich people, but also me and you. That's why I'm excited to be working again with Ren. Ren is a company with a clear mission, do whatever they can to reduce carbon emissions as much as possible with your help. Ren has gathered together some of the most promising carbon reduction projects on earth. When you go to their website, you can have a look over which ones you like best. And with a monthly subscription to Ren, you can actually fund them believe in affecting change through lobbying, you can put money towards policy groups that advocate politicians to enact zero emissions policies. Prefer something more direct? You can help provide drones to indigenous communities in the Amazon, which they use to monitor the rainforest and prevent people from illegal deforestation before it reaches a large scale. Want to reduce emissions while helping people in need? There's also a project that provides clean burning fuel and cook stoves for Ugandan refugees. Once you visit the website, you can dig deep into every one of the options before you make your choice. Ren puts together the data, gives you updates, and links you to reliable articles to learn more about each project. Ending the climate crisis is going to be incredibly difficult, but you can make a real step towards that by learning more on Ren.co. Offset your carbon footprint on Ren. The first 100 people who sign up using the link in the description or the pinned comment will have 10 extra trees planted in their name. I know I just put up five, I meant 10. Just go to ren.co slash start slash chill goblin. That's ren.co slash start slash chill goblin. Chill goblin, all one word. There's no space. Don't put a space in the URL. It's not, it won't, it's not how they work. All right, now let's start talking about comedy. And to quote the headline of every article ever written about this industry, it's no laughing matter. <laughs> It's a very wild time to be a comedian. We didn't sign up to be heroes. We admit we're very flawed people, but we want to just keep fighting for free speech. I love stand-up. I'm totally addicted to it. it it's uh, free speech. It's all that's left. My own opinion is comedy is the last bastion of free speech. And You know, I think stand-up comedy is the last bastion of free speech. Comedy is the last bastion of free speech. Let's try not to kill it. Stand-up comedy, the last Sebastian Maniscalco of free speech. Comedians are courageous warrior philosophers, boldly fighting a dangerous battle on the front lines of being able to say stuff without legal consequence. And what do they do with that freedom? Well, 
Mostly, they use it to say that stand-up comedy is the last bastion of free speech. But is that true, or is it just something comedians repeat because it sounded smart when Bill Hicks said it? Is this guild of traveling drunks actually the final defense we have against an Orwellian nightmare world where we can't even ask thought-provoking philosophical questions like, y'all like weed in here or what? <laughs> this guy knows what I'm talking about. I'm never exactly sure what kind of free speech people mean when the subject gets brought up, but I think most people, including myself, are in favor of the general concept. On the other hand, I find that when someone's going on and on about how important free speech is, my alarm bells go off. You know, hey, I, I, I think people should be entitled to their beliefs and they, they should generally be able to express them, but I'm not about to go attend anything calling itself a free speech rally. For sure, I'd love to go march in favor of free speech with you. I love free speech. I just want to make sure I'm getting the slogan right. Who exactly will not replace us? The comedians who talk about free speech, at least, aren't doing it because they're Nazis. At least not most of them. Judy Gold, a queer Jewish comedian who's a frequent guest on the Majority Report, now that's real leftist cred, wrote a whole book about comedy and free speech called Yes, I Can Say That. When they come for the comedians, we are all in trouble. I like Judy Gold, and I support her free speech right to have the cringiest book title I've heard in years. Anyway, here's a quote from that book that sums up what I consider a good faith argument against comedy censorship that a lot of comedians would probably agree with. It's no longer just right-wing conservatives who are silencing comedians and artists. Attempts at censorship are now coming from the so-called progressive left as well. Political correctness has somehow resulted in not just adding a dimension of discomfort to the meaning of words, but a fear of the words themselves, so much so that uttering certain words, no matter the context, cannot be tolerated, and in some instances can seriously damage a comedian's career. That's right, the left hates words, and as a leftist, it physically hurts me that I need to use words to talk about how dangerous words can be. When communism is achieved, we will abolish sentences. Now there's this idea that comedians in the so-called progressive left are adversaries locked in an eternal battle. Comedians think leftists take their jokes too seriously, and they're right. Leftists think comedians take comedy too seriously, and they're also right. When comedians make a mistake, or if a joke goes too far, the left tends to get very upset, many times a little too upset. I think we all know this, and when any comedian or any aspect of comedy is being attacked, comedians get defensive and pretentious. In the mind of someone on the left, comedians need to be able to accept criticism. Some jokes are harmful and should be called out so the comedian and society can learn. In the mind of a comedian, why do they call it a hot dog when it's made out of a pig? And also in the mind of a comedian, leftists need to understand that jokes are just supposed to make you laugh, and there's no reason to be upset. Here's the thing, I consider myself a leftist, but I've also been doing comedy to varying degrees of mediocrity for about 10 years now. I've got one foot in both camps here, and nobody likes that. Comedians can definitely be pretentious about what they do. People are understandably annoyed listening to comics talk about stand-up as if it's the purest possible art form. Unfortunately, I think I might unironically believe that. Stand up done well has the capacity to bring you into someone's world, to force you to empathize and understand someone completely different than you in a way that I honestly don't think is possible through other media. It's a dangerous and at times nearly impossible form of public speaking where through your words alone, you must bring your audience again and again to a state of uncontainable joy. Difficulty aside, it's also theoretically one of the most accessible art forms. No need to buy a bunch of expensive supplies. All you need is somewhere to write your ideas down and an open mic in your area. Stand-up does well in economic downturns because it's the poor man's theater. Not only is it an extremely affordable art form to enjoy, you will often see it without intending or wanting to. And finally, jokes are very cool, and funny things make my brain feel good. The Mona Lisa's fine, I guess, but uh, she ever made you laugh? 
All right, please sign my petition for the Louvre to open an exhibit showcasing Jim Gaffigan's Hot Pockets bit. Anyway, because of the nature of the art form, comedy legitimately requires a ridiculous amount of free space, benefit of the doubt, and leeway so that the jokes and the joke writers can become as funny as they can possibly be. Now, the problem with stand-up I want to outline here is this. The way that stand-up comedian culture approaches the concept of free speech is flawed. This happens in two steps. First, there's no agreed-upon definition of free speech. Just about every comic talks about it, but it's never clear what they mean by this other than, I should be able to say whatever I want on stage. Second, comedians take this vague, nebulous thing that's really more of a phrase than a concept, and they romanticize it and uplift it above all other values in this blind devotion to a hollowed-out and nearly meaningless free speech ideal is something I'll be referring to as the platinum massification of free speech. The platinum mass is a false idol, like a golden calf, worshipped uncritically by its comedian followers. Like a platinum ass, it's considered inherently valuable, but it's not clear what its purpose is, and it's also full of shit. The platinum ass has all kinds of repercussions that suck for comedy. It makes some comedians accept without thinking the cynical right-wing framing of free speech, making them into useful idiots for conservative thought. Worse, the ass is thick enough to provide very effective cover for fascists and white supremacists. Worst of all, the platinum ass can turn otherwise great comedians into defensive, doubling down on bigotry, unfunny assholes. I guess that's not as bad as the fascists part, but it sucks. I'm just going to keep this video essay rolling and introduce your next titled section. Please welcome the Jesus Christ of comedy, the Gospel of Lenny Bruce. Why are comedians so annoying about free speech? Well, there actually is a surprisingly specific backstory to this that's really going to help us to open this platinum ass up. You see, stand-up comedy is a lot like Christianity. It's a martyr cult. Only difference is that in stand-up, the Jewish guy with the absent father who died for our sins was named Lenny Bruce. Comedians are annoying about threats to our free speech for the same reason that Christians are annoying about crosses. Now, Lenny Bruce was born in rural New York in 1925. His mother was a dancer and stand-up comedian herself who was also the talent scout who discovered both Cheech and Chong. Lenny joined the U.S. Navy at 16, saw action in World War II, and was kicked out of the army for performing in drag and apparently convincing his ship's medical officer that he was experiencing homosexual urges as a joke. All right. Good, good prank, Lenny. Bruce eventually moved to New York City to pursue stand-up comedy. He started out doing routines very influenced by his mother's comedy style, often about his relationship with his mother. Despite how bizarre that sounds, he struggled to figure out how to differentiate himself from all the other struggling comics. Oh, look, there's another white guy on stage pretending to be his own mom. <laughs> These guys are a dime a dozen. Stand-up comedy was an art form invented by accident during the American vaudeville era. Between big acts, a single performer would go out and kill time by standing up on the stage and telling a few one liners to keep the audience entertained, giving the other performers time to leisurely apply their blackface. Now, this simple format endured past the vaudeville age because it both captivated the audience and was just cheap as hell to produce. By the time Lenny was coming up, comedy still held on to a lot of its vaudeville roots, mostly focusing on one-liners and gags. But Lenny started to develop something different. Bruce was working in a lot of burlesque clubs, introducing strippers, and the atmosphere was more permissive for the sort of material he wanted to do. He would do these stream-of-consciousness, free-association rants, incorporating rhythmic influence from jazz and the beat movement into his comedic delivery. Taking stand-up comedy beyond its sanitized vaudeville roots, Lenny started writing jokes about the injustice of segregation, censorship, the Catholic Church, and organized religion, homophobia, sex, and sexuality. Whatever he was creating, it looked a lot closer to what we think of as stand-up comedy today. Struggling with money, Bruce once posed as a laundry man so he could steal a priest shirt and collar from a Florida church. Posing as a priest, Brother Lenny began soliciting donations for a leper colony. Now, he was arrested for this, but found not guilty because the local clergy couldn't prove he wasn't a real priest. You gotta keep better records, boys. Anyway, according to Bruce, 
He made $8,000 in three weeks, generously deciding to send 2,500 of that to an actual leper colony. What a good guy. Now, Lenny Bruce's real struggle with the law actually didn't start with a free speech case. In 1961, Lenny was arrested in Philadelphia for drugs, although everything he had on him was legally prescribed. A cop offered him the opportunity to bribe a judge to get out of the situation. Brucey Big Balls refused this request and then named and roasted the judge and the cop in a TV interview. The charges were dropped, but Lenny had just become an enemy of America's most powerful organized crime syndicate, the police. Just five days after his baseless drug arrest in Philadelphia, he had a gig in San Francisco where he was arrested for the first time for obscenity. It was for telling a joke that used the word cocksuckers. He went to trial and Lenny won. The victory was short-lived as Bruce had entered into a cycle of police harassment, arrested at nearly every show he went to all across the country, his home constantly invaded by cops, with or without a warrant, hoping to find him with drugs. At first, he was able to dodge these charges. Then, at one point in Chicago, Lenny was on trial for telling anti-Catholic jokes. According to Bruce's friend, Paul Klassner, the trial took place over Ash Wednesday and the judge, bailiff, and prosecutors all had spots of ash on their foreheads. Perhaps not coincidentally, this was the first trial that successfully found Lenny Bruce guilty of obscenity. This is where things started to turn. It soon became nearly impossible for Lenny to find work. Venues were afraid to host him because if he were arrested, they would be charged as well. In his home state of New York, Bruce was arrested again for obscenity along with the two club owners who had booked him at the Cafe Ogogo. Losing this New York case would essentially mean the end of his career. Lenny by this time had become obsessive about the case, reading through books of old legal precedents and poring over dense legal jargon, looking for any possible way out of the case that threatened his right to perform, his right to freedom of speech, his right to exist. Against the advice of his lawyer, he took the stand and begged the judges to be allowed to perform his act for them, certain that if they could hear his act in context, they'd understand what he was doing. They refused this request and declared him guilty of obscenity. Depressed, broke, running out of options, Lenny Bruce returned to his home in LA, where on the same day, the bank foreclosed on his house and he died of a morphine overdose. A friend of Bruce's found him dead on the bathroom floor, pants around his ankles, and to give him a little dignity, he apparently pulled Lenny Bruce's pants up before the police arrived. Bro move, right there. But when the cops showed up, they actually allowed a long parade of press photographers into Bruce's house, two at a time, to take their own photos of Bruce, who was somehow now completely naked, heroin needle in his arms, syringes on the floor next to him. Sure seems like the cops took his clothes off and deliberately posed his dead body to publicly humiliate Bruce as a degenerate. It was obvious to basically everyone that a grave miscarriage of justice had occurred. One of the attorneys who prosecuted Bruce even spoke about how guilty he felt about his part in the case. Well, we drove him into poverty and bankruptcy and then murdered him. Watched him gradually fall apart. It's the only thing I did in Hogan's office that I'm really ashamed of. Uh, we all knew what we were doing. We used the law to kill him. Jesus Christ, eh? What a quote. My God. After Bruce died, the courts reversed their decision and let the owners of the cafe, Cafe Ogogo, go, acquitted of all charges. Since that time, no comedian in the United States has ever been convicted of obscenity. We thank you for your sacrifice, Lenny. Now let us hear the Lenny prayer. Amen, Lenny. Free speech is an undeniably powerful story, and its power is transubstantiated right up the sphincter of the platinum ass of free speech. Comics who are the most devoted to it often call themselves free speech absolutists. I'm a free speech absolutist in a lot of ways, too. Mm. I just, I think... Now, saying you're a free speech absolutist is kind of like saying you're a pacifist. It's fun to say because it makes you sound cool and principled. But as soon as you're asked a hypothetical question where your mom's going to get killed if you don't flick someone in the nuts, you have to acknowledge that no, you're not a total pacifist. You think violence is bad, but could potentially be justified just like everyone else. 
Free speech absolutism is like that too. Oh, you believe in absolute freedom of speech. Okay, so can your therapist write a column in the New York Times describing in great detail that dream you told them about? Yeah, that dream? Okay, so would you be cool with it if every day at work your boss asked you to send him pictures of your delicious toes? Okay, so can some guy just walk into your house whenever he wants and start reading you poems about his rectal prolapse? Like if you find yeah. actually, like if yeah, there's that, a yeah. new Hitler and he right. arises and he really does want to exterminate the Jews, what happens there? Do you just allow that guy to be on Google? Is he on yeah. Google Hangouts with a yeah. little Nazi hangout? And they're planning on exterminations and where they right. where's the next uh, Auschwitz? You know, yeah. no, I don't think that that shouldn't be the case. Wow. <laughs> Feminist SJW woke scold Joe Rogan thinks Hitler shouldn't be allowed on Google Hangouts. What a censorship advocate. Good thing for him he's bald, because that guy's hair would for sure be blue. Also, a quick aside, but if Hitler did come back, I think Google Hangouts should be the only place he's allowed to express himself, because that would ensure no one ever hears from him. Anyway, the thing is, nobody, not even Joe Rogan, is really a free speech absolutist at the end of the day. At this point, maybe a good question to ask is, what do we mean when we say we're pro-free speech? What the fuck even is free speech? Now, if you're American, you're probably pointing your giant foam finger at your curved 600-inch plasma widescreen, spitting out half-digested chunks of deep-fried bald eagle while gurgling the words, First Amendment, motherfucker! Okay, cool. Does the First Amendment cover free speech? I didn't know that. That makes it easy. Let's check it out. Congress shall make no law respecting an assembly. Actually, let me just stop you there. We already heard everything we needed to know in the first word. The First Amendment only covers Congress, so the government can't stop people from saying what they want. So what happened to Lenny Bruce is absolutely a massive First Amendment violation, something Bruce himself often pointed out. And this is where the U.S. government's legal commitment to free speech ends, but... Can we possibly imagine anyone other than the state using their power to stop people from speaking freely? Maybe, for example, some type of website that you're on right now? In the excerpt from her book I quoted earlier, Judy Gold expressed surprise that, ironically, the left wing used to be the free speech crowd, but now they seem to more often be the ones fighting against it. And Gold is far from the only comedian to have made this observation. Uh, I'm your typical... Um, liberal, lefty, snowflake, champagne, socialist, uh, anti-racist, uh, anti-sexist, anti-homophobic sort of guy. But if I tweet about freedom of speech, I'm suddenly alt-right. The thing is, Ricky Gervais is right. Not about being against homophobia, but the observation that the political ideology associated with freedom of speech has changed massively over the last 100 years or so. The arguments we were having about free speech at the start of the 20th century are completely different from the ones we're having now. But what's incorrect is the platinum-ass assumption that free speech is an immovable, unchanging, natural law that can't be twisted to partisan ends. Here's an old anti-free speech one-liner that you've probably heard before. The most stringent protection of free speech would not protect a man falsely shouting fire in a theater and causing a panic. Now, who was it who said that? Maybe someone trying to get Netflix to ban Dave Chappelle? Well, actually, that's a quote from 1919 by Supreme Court Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes Jr. It sounds pretty reasonable on its own, but actually in context, it sucked. Holmes used this folksy phrase to illustrate why the First Amendment shouldn't protect people protesting the draft during World War I. The person shouting fire in this metaphor was a guy handing out flyers against conscription, and the crowded theater was a bunch of poor people about to be forced into Europe's first imperial Super Bowl. Sure, free speech is usually great and shouldn't be stifled, but any reasonable person would agree we must arrest those who try to talk to people who are busy being forced to die pointlessly. Now, leftists in the early 20th century fought a hard battle against a government with far more power to suppress their right to protest war, to form unions, to improve working conditions, and to protect marginalized groups who were speaking out about their oppression. All of these forms of free speech, very important to the left. In the 60s, anti-war protests at Berkeley made free speech a specific rallying cry for leftists. It's the same time that everything was going down with Lenny Bruce. So free speech really was a left-wing thing. 
but free speech, at least as a phrase, means something far different now. It's the freedom for you and your Discord friends to shout anti-Semitic slogans in public. It's the freedom for race scientists to speak on college campuses. It's the freedom of shitty comedians everywhere to get booked and platformed on syndicated TV shows, even though they make the audience uncomfortable. So sometime in the 80s, things shifted to the right, but the right had a very different conception of what exactly free speech meant. Several books were written all around the same time about free speech on college, campuses, and places of higher learning, something that still dominates discussion of free speech today. Tucker Carlson has a recurring segment called Campus Craziness all about this. Of course, the right appropriates leftist terms and values for their own cause all the time. Think about how terms like libertarian or diversity of thought or wokeness have been repurposed for anti-progressive ends. Even the Nazis called themselves national socialists. But I argue that the right's appropriation of free speech as a cause was in some ways more successful than any other example because it was somehow done without anyone noticing. The meaning changed. but. Most people carried on as if it had stayed the exact same. The ACLU, an organization that was once explicitly leftist, whose primary client was the American Communist Party, who fought for labor rights and represented victims of union busting in court, has now become the organization that fights on behalf of the Charlottesville Nazis for their right to carry tiki torches with racist intent. And if you can fool an organization of lawyers and lobbyists, you can probably fool comedians too. Comedians were big into free speech when Lenny Bruce was getting arrested, and they're big into free speech now. Most didn't notice the shift, and that's why they regularly express confusion that free speech is supposed to be a left-wing issue, but now it seems like a right-wing thing? What's going on with the left? Have they lost their way? The problem is that free speech was never properly defined, and perhaps it can't be. It's a really useful rallying cry, because it instinctively seems like something good that we are all in favor of, but since nobody really thinks that speech should be absolutely free, the meaning of that phrase is up for grabs. You'll notice that while the right loves calling leftists hypocrites for their selective interpretation of free speech, you don't ever see them advocating against illegal union busting, which is at least as much of a violation of the First Amendment as canceling the speaking engagements of Nazis is. Clickbait title of this video aside, I think legal free speech protections are a great thing. I oppose people being imprisoned or charged for speech alone anywhere around the world. The thing is, I also think that true free speech doesn't exist and never has, and that's fine, actually. If all speech was absolutely free, comedy would suck. Comedy clubs wouldn't be able to eject hecklers. Stealing jokes would be completely fine. Worst of all, shows would have to go on for as long as there were comedians looking for stage time, creating a theoretically infinitely long lineup of some of the best comedians in the city that, were they to really be coming at you hot, coming at you live, coming at you all night long, would nearly instantly cause the universe to collapse on itself. What's it like to be a comedian? I think it'll help to talk about what the comedian experience is like. Religious devotion is often strengthened through hardship, and I gotta tell you, stand-up is, like, really hard. It's unique as an art form in a lot of ways. For one thing, the relationship between the comedian and the audience. Brian Regan once described comedy audiences like this. Well, the audience is a thing. I try to play it like an instrument. I try to make this thing laugh. I don't think of it as a group of individuals. I think of it as this big blob of humanity, and I want to get it laughing. The audience is the instrument. That is the major difference between comedy and music, aside from how hard it is to get laid after a comedy set. If you want to get good at guitar, you can practice for hours and hours every day alone in your room, and you can suck for years and years alone in your room. To get good at comedy, you gotta suck in public for a long time. And even when you're good, you're never completely safe from sucking in public from time to time. The first few years, let's say the first decade or so of a stand-up's career, is spent laying the groundwork. There's a lot to figure out. There's the elusive voice that every comedian must try to find. There's formulas of joke construction which must be discovered, subverted, and become so thoroughly practiced that jokes can be formed instinctively. 
There's figuring out the funniest words. If you're curious, I'm pretty sure the funniest words are booty hole, scrotum, twat, and cum. Hard consonants create strong punchlines. Strong punchlines create good times. Good times create weak men. And weak the fuck am I talking about? Now, lots of comedians spend the first phase of their career just learning to write jokes. Write down every funny thing you think of. Don't be lazy. Your job is to take the stuff floating around inside your weird brain and turn it into words that cause a specific reaction in the minds and bodies of the people who hear those words. Joke topics to a comedian are like colors to a painter, but instead of cerulean blue, burnt umber, and cadmium red, we've got weed, tinder, and sexual assault. Another part of the comedian's journey in their first few years of stand-up is to figure out where the line is. You might find out that something that made you and your drunk friends laugh at 3 a.m. in your apartment makes people angrily storm out of the bar when you say it into a microphone. Comedians are free to say things like this, and they should be, but walking the room is going to piss off the comedians after you, not to mention the bar that put on the show that's now losing customers. There's a useful concept called punching up and punching down that highlights the status of the joke's target relative to the teller of the joke. If the comedian is using comedy to attack someone with more power than themselves, they are punching up. And if they're attacking someone below them, they're punching down. It's probably better to punch up as often as possible and avoid punching down, especially at the beginning of your stand-up career when you probably suck at it. Now, doing good, edgy, down-punching jokes is possible, but it's a difficulty level higher. Anybody can get a laugh talking about buttholes, but it takes a real genius to crush with a joke about the Holocaust. Also, though, I think this concept gets misused a lot. Punching up or down, in my experience, is about joke construction, not material conditions. People generally prefer jokes where they root for the person who's presented in the joke as the underdog, regardless of if they actually are or not. I've seen crowds clap and cheer for jokes where the poor, helpless, old white dude comedian gets one over on the all-powerful, uptight, POC, feminist college student, but in the world of the joke, the comedian was still punching up. Now, there's an infinite amount of comedy styles, and this is just my opinion, but I think stand-up's at its best when it creates the illusion of a conversation. And when you watch a comedy show, it should kind of feel like you're just talking to some hilarious stranger you met at a bar. And the comedian might do some crowd work and ask the audience simple questions and employ tricks to make everybody feel like everything they're saying is made up on the spot, no matter how meticulously crafted it is. It's not really a conversation, of course, but it sure feels like one. Except that it kind of is a conversation. Stand-up is usually thought of as being a solo art form, one without any collaboration, yet everything a comedian puts in their act must be approved by their co-writer, the audience. You'll write a joke that you think is funny, try it out on stage, and then based on what laughs you get, you might decide to make some parts bigger, cut some lines, change some wording, and rewrite it over and over again until the joke is as good as you can get it, and ideally, it's going to work as a joke in as many different rooms as possible. But you never know how good a joke is until you've tried it out. Now, through this process, the comedian's act is a reflection of not just the comedian, but the audience the comedian is telling the jokes to. When I started doing stand-up about 10 years ago, there was another comic, a white guy, with a joke about an old Indian guy he met. And most of it was just him doing an Indian accent. And every time I saw him do that joke, it destroyed. Crowds loved it. Now, the way I'm describing it, it probably sounds like a trash joke, but I definitely remember thinking at the time that it was really funny. He would close his sets with it because it always got his biggest laughs. Now, that dude quit comedy for about six years, and when he came back in 2018, all of a sudden, that joke was bombing. Audiences heard a white guy doing an Indian accent, and they just weren't laughing at it like they used to. It was endlessly fascinating for me to watch this guy bomb with his old closer. So what does that mean? Did wokeness ruin comedy? I would say no. Time ruined comedy as it usually does. I wrote this script two days ago, and my God, the jokes have not aged well. Comedy's like milk. It ages poorly. And if you're not careful, it can give you a mustache. 
The joke with the Indian accent was really funny in 2012, but the audience rejected it in 2018 in much the same way they might reject a joke from 2012 with a Gangnam Style reference. It's just not where the culture is at anymore, and that's fine. One of the best examples of this is Lenny Bruce. Watch any of his stuff. You probably aren't going to laugh. The Other Lennies. Comedy's Greatest Free Speech Battles. I don't want to do this essay without acknowledging the times that get brought up as examples of comedians' free speech being under attack. I'm going to divide these attacked comedians into three categories and one subcategory based on who or what they're being oppressed by. So the first category is the most intense one. Comedians who are punished for their jokes by force from the state. Personally, I'm comfortable saying that this is a bad thing and it shouldn't ever happen. The most obvious example of this is Lenny Bruce, but there are others. George Carlin was briefly arrested in 1972 for disorderly conduct after performing his joke about the seven words you can't see on television, which involves some profanity. Just a couple years ago, in 2016, French-Canadian comedian Mike Ward was fined $42,000 for a joke he made about a famous disabled child where he called them ugly and described drowning them. Sorry for that description, Ward fans. I know I'm butchering the joke. I'm sure it's somehow hilarious in the original French-Canadian, which, to be fair, is a very funny type of French. Anyway, Ward fought the case, and it was eventually struck down by the Canadian Supreme Court in 2021. For now, at least. Us Canadians can rest easy knowing we are free to talk to stadium audiences about our fantasy of murdering a specific child. The bedrock of democracy. Now, this next guy isn't a stand-up, but a YouTube comedian, ugh, gross, named Count Dankula, who was charged 800 pounds for uploading a video where he taught his girlfriend's pug to zig heil and to get excited whenever Dankula advocated genocide. So this one actually made it all the way through the courts, and Dankula had to pay the 800 pounds. I'm not familiar, personally, with the free speech laws in the UK. I've seen people say that according to the law, Dankula was rightfully charged. Maybe that's true, maybe it's not, but to be honest, I don't really care about what the law is. I agree that it was a very bad joke, and I'm not totally sure if at the time Dankula was a Nazi or just a moron. Either way, I absolutely do not think a shitty edgelord prank video rises to a level requiring government intervention. Moving on to the next category here, we have the comedians who lost their jobs over jokes they made. Lots of examples of this. Roseanne was fired from her sitcom, her name literally written out of the show's title after making a racist joke on Twitter. Roseanne's very suspicious excuse later was that she didn't know the person she was being racist to was black. And if that's the case, it sure is an unfortunate coincidence she happens to hurl anti-black insults at them. Yeah, I told him to go back to Africa. I thought he was Swedish. Sure thing, buddy. The late Gilbert Gottfried was once the voice of the Aflac Duck, a mascot for some Fortune 500 company. Uh, presumably, that was some pretty good money for him. In 2011, in the aftermath of a tsunami in Japan, Gottfried made some purposely tasteless jokes about the tragedy on Twitter. I'm not going to repeat them all here, but I will repeat this one, because it's way cornier than I would have ever thought possible. What does every Japanese person have in their apartment? Floodlights! That's my, that's my Gilbert Gottfried impression. Hey, I, I don't know. I didn't know what it was going to sound like until I started saying it. Gottfried made a public apology for his jokes, a decision which he later strongly regretted. With this category, there is no mystery at all why these people were punished for their jokes. The companies that fired them aren't anti-free speech, and they're definitely not anti-racist. They're just pro-buying the CEO a new super yacht. ABC execs fired Roseanne from a sitcom for the same reason they greenlit it in the first place, because it seemed like the decision most likely to get them as many advertising dollars in the next quarter as possible. Affleck fired Gilbert for the tsunami jokes because they do 75% of their business in Japan. But was it right for Roseanne and Gilbert to lose their jobs? Eh, maybe. In these cases, both of them were going to be okay, just slightly less rich, not a matter of life and death. But this is definitely not always the case for comics who lose their jobs. The question here is, is it right for a corporation to have the power to take away someone's livelihood overnight just because of a joke they told away from the workplace outside of office hours? Do people only deserve to eat food and live indoors if they can demonstrate value to a giant corporation of some kind? I say no. 
If we want comedians to stop losing their jobs in this way, we should really abolish capitalism. That's right. The real cancel culture was the invisible hand of the market all along. Speaking of cancel culture, we've got the final category here, comedians who get canceled over jokes by their audiences. Moving down the hierarchy of authority here from the state to corporations to just a bunch of people. Mob justice, the pitchfork and tortures lobby, the court of public opinion. If you watch a lot of stand-up or you listen to a lot of comedian podcasts, you'd be forgiven for thinking that comedians might be the world's most oppressed class, constantly fearing for their life and under attack by people on Twitter or bloggers or woke journalists. And it's true that all those people thirst for comic blood. But how many comedians can you name who have been actually canceled? Name one right now. Say it out loud to your screen like you're watching Dora the Explorer. No, okay, I meant name someone who was canceled over jokes, not over being a sexual predator. See, it's hard. Now, here's where the platinum ass butts in. In my opinion, this is the point that comedians' fetishization of some nebulous, unexplained concept of free speech can turn them into right-wing reactionaries. If your joke leads to consequences enforced by state power or corporate power, that sucks. But it's a little different when it's a group of people without institutional power pushing back on you. Now, these cases don't tend to result in people losing their jobs or being put in jail, but it can lead to a higher level of public scrutiny than most comedians are comfortable with. One really common venue for this sort of complaint is college campuses. So college shows can be one of the best sources of income for a lot of comics, but at the same time, many impose restrictions on the subjects of jokes and have audiences more likely to take offense to jokes they perceive as harmful than, say, a club crowd. Huge comedians like Seinfeld and Chris Rock have spoken out about how they don't do college gigs for this reason. Unsurprisingly, this dovetails perfectly with the right wing's obsession with free speech on college campuses. Here's an example of the dangers of campus speech suppression. Nimish Patel is a comedian and the first Indian writer for SNL. He was once booked to perform at an event put on by the Asian American Alliance at Columbia University, but his mic was cut off about 20 minutes into the show after he told the following joke about gay black people in his neighborhood. Oh, this is, this is how I figured out that being gay can't be a choice. Because no one would choose to be gay if they're already black. I'm not wrong. No one's doubling down on hardship. No black dude ever wakes up, looks in the mirror and thinks, you know what, this black shit, too easy. <laughs> I'm going to put on a Madonna halter top and some Jordans and make some Indian dudes real uncomfortable. That's never happened before. You guys get tense on the weirdest things. That's a strong joke. And that joke bombed, total silence from the audience. He started to win the crowd back, but it didn't matter because about five minutes later, the organizers came on stage, asked him to leave, and turned off his microphone. I'm 100% sure that joke would do really well in most settings. In a lot of ways, the joke's very progressive. It comedically highlights the negative effect of being at multiple intersections of oppression. It's also an argument against the once very common homophobic talking point that being gay is a choice. But let's be fair, I can definitely see how it could be offensive as well. For one thing, the punchline sort of says that the gay black guys in Patel's neighborhood make him uncomfortable. Anyway, it's not a bad joke, but sometimes you didn't read the room right. A big part of stand-up is sometimes bombing with material you thought was good. If comedy was easy, it wouldn't be as much fun when it goes well. So the incident predictably became an instant right-wing news story with articles in Breitbart, Tucker Carlson asked Patel on his show, which he very smartly refused to do, calling Tucker a propagandist. He didn't say no, though, to writing an article in the liberal New York Times, where he wrote this. When you silence someone you don't agree with or you find offensive, not only do you implement the tactic used by the people you disdain, 
you also do yourself the disservice of missing out on a potentially meaningful conversation. You cannot affect change if you're not challenged. And this is where I get annoyed with Nimesh. With this quote, intentionally or not, he's parroting the precise anti-college talking points you see every six news stories on Fox News. Shaming people for refusing to be challenged, cutting themselves off from meaningful conversation, lecturing these students by saying that silencing him is just as bad as what the people they hate do. Also, I can't not mention this, calling himself silenced in the pages of one of the most widely circulated newspapers on Earth. He also later talked about this on the number one podcast on Earth, Joe Rogan. In fact, this exact argument has been used to defend actually confirmed white supremacists like Charles Murray. Murray's book, The Bell Curve, argues through entirely discredited statistical analysis that black people are genetically less intelligent than white people and should therefore receive less social assistance. Murray's work is not science, but a product of clearly racist motivations and an extremist libertarian ideology that's been thoroughly debunked several times over. A year before the Nimesh Patel incident, in 2017, Middlebury College booked Charles Murray for a public debate. After his appearance was announced, disgusted students protested the event, speaking over Murray and forcing him to do the debate on a live stream instead of for a live audience. Now, footage of this protest became huge for the far right, who breathlessly spoke about what a dangerous sign for free speech this was. The argument boiled down to the idea that, much like comedians are obviously entitled to tell jokes to college kids, social Darwinists must be given the opportunity to come to your campus and promote eugenics. It's only fair. So, I am a bit confused as to why this is such a big subject of debate. Not all ideas get to be debated on a university stage. I can't get a spot at Middlebury College to argue in favor of my idea to blow up the ocean, even though I keep emailing them my availability. They don't care about how epic it would look. Apparently, blowing up the ocean isn't considered a topic with enough value to debate that Charles Murray was invited to debate his ideas implies that the university believes there is some merit to what he's saying. Therefore, having him there reveals that, to some extent, Middlebury administration believes that black people are genetically inferior. Take your head out of the platinum ass for one second and understand that none of us are true free speech absolutists. And now ask yourself if society would have survived if the university had just cancel the debate with Dr. KKK. And Nimesh Patel is obviously a completely different case. He was not the right fit for the comedy night and was asked to leave. Definitely harsh. I know I'd be pissed if it happened to me, but in the end, it's just really not a big deal. What's gross, though, is that Nimesh's knee-jerk, free speech rules everything around me approach to dealing with the incident actually ends up creating some of the exact propaganda he was trying to avoid contributing to on the Tucker Carlson show. Here's Charles Murray on Tucker, though, right after his incident. Well, last March, one of the great living sociologists in America, Charles Murray, went to Middlebury College. Murray's an important figure, that's not an overstatement, but instead of listening to any of this, the students rioted. Charles Murray has not appeared on television since that incident. He is here now, the man at the center of it all. Charles Murray joins us tonight. Um, Charles Murray, thanks a lot for coming on. My pleasure. That the whole notion of a university is that it is a safe space, if I may use that phrase, for intellectual discourse. That is the thing it's supposed to do. Yes. And, and you know, in thinking about Middlebury, what went on inside that lecture hall was a repudiation of what the university is all about. It's terrifying. And I wish their minds were open to hearing it. <laughs> <laughs> because they'd be a lot better. Well, if they want to invite me back, I'd be glad to they go. They ought to. Charles Murray, thank you for that. Great to see you. My pleasure. Fox News also published an article by Charles Murray where he said that the protesting students resembled brown shirts, 
much like Nimish Patel wagging his finger at these college kids and saying that they were becoming the thing they hated the most. Now, the subsection to this, let's call it 3C, the lowest rung on the ladder of violations of comedian speech, has got to be the ones that cry cancel culture about audiences who just don't like them. Edgelord comedy bad boy Jerry Seinfeld had a lot of complaints about how modern audiences didn't appreciate his joke about people on their phones looking like gay French kings. I do this joke about um, uh, the way people need to have the, justify their cell phone. I need to have it with me because people are so important. Right. You know, I said, well, they don't seem very important the way you scroll through them like a gay French king. <laughs> you know, just... <laughs> Comedy's where you can kind of feel like an opinion. And they thought, yeah. what do you mean, gay? What are you talking about, gay? What are you saying, gay? What are you, what are you doing? What do you, what do you mean, you know? You, I could imagine a time, and, and this is a serious thing, I can imagine a time when people say, well, that's offensive to suggest that a gay person moves their hands in a flourishing motion, <laughs> and you now need to apologize. I mean... There's a creepy PC thing out there that really bothers me. Okay, let's recap here. So he wasn't protested or deplatformed or even booed. He told a joke and people didn't laugh at it. Yeah, I'd suggest to you that if the audience almost laughed, that means your joke was almost funny and you should either make it funny or throw the joke out and get a better one. Seinfeld, I can't believe I have to say this, but stop blaming the audience. Get some better material. Come on, you're Jerry Seinfeld. You know how to improve your jokes. Get Larry David to write them. It's so funny to me when comics feel entitled to laughter for their edgy jokes, but you ever notice how if your joke isn't edgy, you've got no right to complain if it bombs? Nobody goes on Seth Meyers talking about how today's college crowds don't like puns anymore. Yeah, the anti-wordplay crowd has already made up their minds about how none of my jokes can be funny just because they all start with knock, knock. It's like, hey, millennials, orange, you glad that you're ruining the art of comedy? So to sum up this section here, free speech is generally good, but the true violations of it are context dependent. There's a world of difference between Lenny Bruce's fuck the government and Jerry Seinfeld's gay French king, but that difference gets completely flattened if you let that thick platinum ass sit on it. <laughs> Laughter with a mouthful of blood. I don't believe any subject should be off limits for comedy, as everything in existence can be turned inward on itself and made funny, even the most horrible things in life. But as long as we're looking at comedy and free speech, I feel as though we may as well look at the other side of the coin here. So let's entertain the question, can jokes hurt? I asked my friend Piss Panserson if jokes can cause harm, and he said, yes, they absolutely can. And man, I told you, please stop calling me Piss Panserson. My name's Chris Masterson. That was more than 20 years ago. And I was like, oh yeah, I actually forgot about that. In front of the whole class too. What a great day that was. One of the most common defenses comedians give whenever they get pushback on their jokes is that they're just jokes. They're only supposed to make you laugh. Don't take them so seriously. They don't have real power. It bugs the shit out of me when comedians say this because they're comedians. They know how powerful these things are. A stand-up joke won't ever change the world, but I can tell you about a couple that changed me. I only have a sheet on my bed because I saw a comic do a bit about how pathetic she found it when she goes to a guy's place and he has a bare mattress. So I mentioned earlier about how when a lot of comedians start out, they go as edgy as possible. There's a certain ironic detachment some people have to horrible offensive things when they're young and making jokes about them is exciting and taboo. It can even make you a better joke writer to focus on offensive material precisely because the bar for audience approval is higher. But speaking from my experience, as you get older, shitty things will happen to you and to the people you love. And maybe those edgy joke topics won't seem so abstract and harmless anymore. I have no doubt that many comedians who tell racist or sexist jokes aren't racist or sexist themselves. The comic is often just saying upsetting things because they thought of something funny and it just so happened to reinforce a harmful idea in some way. Sometimes bigotry or ignorance can be funny, even if it's punching down. 
But as they evolve as artists, a lot of edgy comics reach an uncomfortable point where they notice some people in the crowd might be enjoying their totally not racist jokes in a racist way. Sarah Silverman, who became known for her early edgy racist material, calls the phenomenon laughter with a mouthful of blood, which is pretty metal. People who feel a kinship with the comedian but couldn't be further off. Silverman has a story about meeting Steve Perry, the singer from Journey, who approached her after her show and said, You're so funny, you have the best N-word jokes. Steve Perry denies he said this, but admits he talked to her about how much he liked her ability to get laughs using racial slurs. I don't know if he's telling the truth or if I should stop believing. Now, I was also surprised to learn that Anthony Jeselnik, a famously edgy, doesn't give a fuck type of comedian who never lets a horrific tragedy go by without tweeting a one-liner about it, noticed as well that there were some laughs coming from mouthfuls of blood in his audience, and he changed his act because of it. Early in my career, there were a lot of jokes about my girlfriend, and you hear the misogynists laugh a little louder. If I talk about race, the racists laugh a little louder. That's why I've gone darker. If you talk about death, everyone's in the same boat. Hey, I'm not, I'm not good at impressions. Amy Schumer describes her onstage persona as a dumb white girl character who says intentionally provocative, upsetting things without realizing it, sometimes at the expense of marginalized groups. When she realized that these jokes had an influence on the people coming to her shows, she decided to stop telling them. I think this evolution a lot of comedians go through is a result of emerging out of the comedian larval stage and moving from learning how to write jokes to finding their comedic voice and getting to a point where they can just talk about the things they actually want to talk about. A lot of people decide that they don't want to do jokes that risk at worst causing harm and at best occasionally making bigots feel good about their hateful views. Is there a place for super edgy jokes? Yeah, of course. But also, unless there's something more to them than just edge, they're kind of just juvenile and boring. Dead baby jokes did something that actual dead babies never get a chance to do. They got old. Probably the most famous example of a comedian who had the mouthful of blood epiphany is Dave Chappelle. Chappelle, easily one of the greatest comedians of all time. He is completely engaging on stage with the added benefit of being an excellent joke writer. And honestly, most comedians are just one or the other. Chappelle's Chappelle's Show show was a massive hit, breaking DVD sales records and considered by many to be the greatest sketch show ever made. Thrilled with his success, Comedy Central offered $50 million for season three. Everything was going great. But something happened during the filming of season three surrounding the infamous Black Pixie sketch. This was a sketch about racial stereotypes about a tiny Black Pixie character who was played by Chappelle in blackface that would pop up and encourage Black people to do stereotypical things. While screening the Black Pixie sketch for an audience, Chappelle saw a white guy in the crowd laughing a little too hard. When he laughed, it made me uncomfortable. As a matter of fact, that was the last thing I shot before I told myself I gotta take fucking time out after this because my head almost exploded. Oh, it's those blasted mouthful of blood laughs again. For other comedians, it's a disorienting moment, one that might make them rethink their whole act and career. But for Dave, it was fundamentally unacceptable. He decided to travel to Saudi Arabia and completely ghosted the multi-million dollar TV show he was at the center of. A decision about which I can only say, hell yeah dude, fuck him. Dave was away from the comedy world for a long time. Since his return, it's been easy to see his evolution as an artist with respect to his material on race. I'll never forget the way he ended his special equanimity with a passionate but direct explanation of the life, death, and historical significance of Emmett Till, a 14-year-old black child who was tortured and killed by white adults who were then acquitted of any crime. This section of the special carries real weight. You can feel the audience accept the shift in tone. And Chappelle is pretty ahead of his time there. About a year before Hannah Gatsby's Nanette blew everyone's mind by deprioritizing laughs per minute 
in a comedy special, Dave was closing his act with a long, jokeless American civil rights history lesson, and he somehow still managed to end it with a punchline. Master of the craft. Incredible to watch. Dave Chappelle knows that jokes can be harmful, and he aspires to something greater than that. And this fact is why it's been extra disappointing to watch Chappelle double, triple, quadruple down on his transphobic material. When Dave Chappelle talks about the history of racism in America, he transforms a stadium of comedy fans into a lecture hall intently listening to an esteemed professor. When he talks about the transgender community, his act morphs into a conversation you wish he hadn't started with the grossest bro at the frat party. A ton of ink has been spilled, podcasts recorded, and better video essays than this one filmed about Chappelle's decision to join Team Turf. And I don't feel like I need to unpack that anymore here. But if you are curious, Check out Chris A's deep dive into The Closer for a great examination. And also just go subscribe to Chris A, massively underrated channel. Check them out. <sighs> Takes a big man to admit this, but I am not as funny as Dave Chappelle or as good at stand-up. However, I do know what it's like to get defensive about a joke. Dave recently returned to his old high school to speak to students there, and they lined up to tell him he was being ignorant about trans people, and that ignorance was putting trans people in danger. Now, Dave then did a whole weird lecture about this situation, which Netflix released, where he confidently talks about how none of the high schoolers were better stand-ups than him, which is such a failed attempt at a brag. Dave, like Chappelle walks into a high school and he's just like, oh wow, I am the best stand up here for sure. Yeah, dude, you've probably also hung out with Elon Musk more than anyone currently attending your old high school. It's just not really relevant to whether or not your jokes are transphobic. I thought it was interesting how Chappelle framed the backlash to the closer from these high schoolers in this clip. The more you say I can't say something, the more urgent it is for me to say it. And it has nothing to do with what you're saying I can't say. It has everything to do with my right, my freedom of artistic expression. That is valuable to me. That is not severed from me. It's worth protecting for me. It's worth protecting for everyone else who endeavors in our noble, noble profession. These kids didn't understand that they were instruments of oppression. It's this free speech shit again. I believe Dave here. I take him at his word. I think he sees himself as a holy warrior in the Platinum Ass's army, the Diamond Turd Brigade. Alongside his comrades Roseanne, Seinfeld, and Count Dankula, he's fighting the good fight, punching up, bravely protecting his fellow comedians from their oppression by the all-powerful trans community. Comedians hear that story of Lenny Bruce and the powerful silencing forces that destroyed him, and it gives them a frame of how to see their world. Now, we uphold and we romanticize a vague, undefined, platinum-assified concept of free speech, and we must protect it at all costs. We're like confused children who go to Sunday school every week, and then we start thinking the mean babysitter must be a Pharisee. Dave Chappelle looks at these high school kids speaking out against transphobia, and he sees the cops throwing Lenny Bruce in jail. He literally calls them instruments of oppression. Let's remember that Dave's free speech was not actually taken away at any point. He made the decision about the specials he wanted to make, about the topics he was interested in, and he made a frankly ridiculous amount of money for it. At no point did these teenage instruments oppression succeed in instrumentally oppressing him. Dave didn't get canceled. He's fine. Netflix is standing by him either because they strongly believe in free speech or they strongly believe he's going to make them a lot of money. Dave's won awards. He's doing, you know, stadium tours. Dave can't really say his right to free speech is under threat. I mean, the several Netflix employees who were fired for protesting Chappelle's special probably could say their free speech is under threat. I think it's a little bit weird that they didn't get any support from the free speech absolutist crowd, but eh, if there's a better single example of how the platinum massification of free speech is ruining stand-up comedy, I don't know what it is.
Chappelle should be at the top of his game right now, putting out just masterpiece after masterpiece, but his specials just get more and more bogged down by this embarrassing defensive transphobia. It sucks that he sucks now. He's, of course, free to torch his own reputation, to use his incredible talent to fill each new special with more and more preachy, self-serving hatred and cultivate a hateful and bigoted audience, the very thing he once traveled across the world to avoid doing. At the climax of this lecture, Dave reveals that he decided not to name the auditorium at the high school he'd funded after himself. He decided it was only right to call it something much cringier. The Theater for Artistic Freedom and Expression. Cancel culture didn't ruin Dave Chappelle. A dogmatic commitment to a meaningless free speech ideal did. And also transphobia. A lot, a lot of transphobia. Uh, partially the free speech thing, partially. Uh, but also a genuine fear of trans people. Comedy Nazis. Comedians definitely take freedom of speech way too seriously. I've seen comics say shit like, free speech is more important than shelter. The most precious thing in life, I think, is food in your mouth. And the third most precious is a roof over your head. But a fixture for me in the number two slot is free expression just below the need to sustain life itself. It rules so hard that Mr. Bean is such a free speech guy. Like, what's he fighting for the right to say exactly? Early in my career, the powers that be did their best to prevent me from speaking the truth. A truth which was, Teddy? Nah, he's a funny guy. I like Mr. Bean. This weird, dogmatic defense of free speech and comedy sucks. It's surprisingly common for comics to say things like, comedy is about offending people. If you're not crossing the line, you're not doing it right. Good comics get laughs. Great comics get their ass kicked after the show. And I gotta say, no. What? That's not what it's about at all. Comedy is literally about the opposite of pissing people off. Are you feeling okay? The vicious twerking of the platinum booty of free speech creates reverberations all across the stand-up world. On the amateur side, it means open mics are full of people doing their first ever set who've chosen the most disgusting and offensive topics possible, and they don't have the decency or skill to include punchlines. I don't want to come down too hard on these edgy boys because, to be honest, that's pretty much exactly what I was doing when I started comedy, but the effect this has is that open mics generally default to a thick, misogynistic, racist, homophobic atmosphere, which likely has the effect of pushing away people in marginalized groups from getting into comedy. So that sucks. But worse than this is the cover that a non-specific commitment to free speech provides for literal fascists. Lots of comedians wouldn't recognize fascism and white supremacy if it was on a four-hour-long podcast with them. The Joe Rogan Experience is the world's most popular podcast hosted by the world's most popular anthropomorphic thumb. Everyone talks about Joe Rogan being in news radio or Fear Factor, but my favorite early role of his was in Spy Kids. They didn't even need to use makeup or CGI for that. It's been wild watching Rogan slip further and further to the right over the years, but he's always had a soft spot for fascists that I think is a direct consequence from the dogma of the platinum ass. Joe Rogan has used his massive platform to push self-proclaimed white nationalist Stephen Molyneux, modern-day Protocols of Zion pusher Alex Jones, and Charles C. Johnson, a Nazi tech entrepreneur who used his three hours on arguably the world's largest media platform to calmly and patiently explain bogus race science about black people's proclivity towards violence to Joe Rogan while the beefy DMT fan leaned forward like, Wow, man, the shape of the skull, huh? That's really interesting. Yeah, well, to be charitable to Rogan, it's entirely possible he's felt completely fine associating his brand with these fascists because of his firm belief in free speech. Joe's not going to judge someone based on the things they've said. Speech is just words. Comedians get a little bit desensitized to things like race essentialism because, after all, white people walk like this and black people walk like this. 
By the time anyone becomes a professional comedian, they've paid their dues spending countless nights in the basements of the worst bars in town, listening to unwashed men with no past and no future, wax philosophical about all the topics you can imagine being banned from Reddit. At higher levels of comedy, all speech is acceptable as long as it's hilarious, but at the open mic level, you just have to make sure to keep it to five minutes. I notice... When some people defend Joe Rogan, they say things like, oh, he's a comic, he just says whatever he wants. Even if what they're defending has nothing to do with comedy, being a comedian is like this eternal, immutable quality. When Rogan was parading Brett Weinstein and his gang of horsey boys on his show every other week to spread dangerous COVID misinformation, people were still like, you don't get it, Joe's a comic. Just let him be a comic. It's like, no. He's not a comedian at that point. He's not just telling jokes. There are literally graphs on screen and not funny graphs about like how hot boobs are over numbers of beers drank or whatever. I swear if a comedian got elected president and started a nuclear war, they'd be like, oh, fellow Americans, what you gotta understand is I'm a comic, all right? This is what we do, all right? I've dropped bigger bombs than that down at the cellar, okay? <laughs> now, before I go, it has been confirmed that everyone in California is now dead, but I was always more of a New York guy anyway. All right, thanks so much. You guys have been great. There's a very popular libertarian comedy podcast called Legion of Skanks, hosted by the very funny Big J Okerson, the very good at self-promotion Louis Gomez, and the very libertarian Dave Smith, who actually read the Murray Rothbard chapters in the audiobook for Michael Malice's Anarchy compilation. Now, the three of them have been on Joe Rogan's podcast many times, together and separately, and they share a lot of the same audience, the Skanks audience obviously being a, quite a bit smaller. Their podcast is much like the Joe Rogan podcast, but with a more conscious and informed pushing of libertarian values, and oh yeah, way more racial slurs. Outside the Legion of Skanks, Dave Smith has his own solo podcast that he's used to interview literal Nazis like Richard Spencer, Nick Fuentes, and Christopher Cantwell, aka The Crying Nazi. Dave Smith obviously has terrible politics, and he finds plenty of things to agree with these guys about, but I'm going to give him the benefit of the doubt here and assume that as a Jewish man, he is probably not himself a Nazi. That leaves me to assume he just thinks it's cool to give a friendly platform to the Genocide fan club over here because he thinks free speech is cool and the more the speech advocates genocide, the more free it is. Now, Louis Gomez once said this regarding how the Skanks podcast was influenced by Proud Boys founder Gavin McInnes. The reason I love Gavin is because he has said the N-word and the F-slur so much that it's not even a big deal. When you come watch the Legion of Skank show, you should be hearing racist, sexist, offensive shit. If you're upset about that, don't watch the show. I gotta tell you, I don't much care for Louis Gomez, but to be fair, the last four words there are very good advice. Speaking of Gavin McInnes, considering how widely acknowledged his shittiness is today, it is fully mind-blowing in retrospect how completely accepted and even embraced he was by the New York comedy scene, despite his already very clearly horrible political views. Name a headliner who's been working a decade or more, and there's a good chance they were at one point guests on The Gavin McInnes Show, a talk show which was also the platform Gavin used to launch his neo-fascist terrorist group, The Proud Boys. Other notable guests on his podcast included Milo Yiannopoulos, Christopher Cantwell, a.k.a. the Boofing Nazi, Richard Spencer, and former KKK leader David Duke. It might seem bizarre that so many high-profile comics would agree to go on this show, but hey, it's free speech, baby. Kevin's not so bad, I'm sure. He's funny. He may not agree with what these Nazis have to say, but he'll defend to the death their right to say it into an EVRE20 microphone to his massive audience. McInnes dabbled in stand-up comedy himself and even had a reactionary podcast that he recorded at the comedy club Stand Up New York that was simply called Free Speech. Destroy that ass. So what's the solution? I don't know. Don't listen to me. I don't know anything about anything. But here's a solution. For comedy fans, watch the stuff you like. Don't watch the stuff you don't like. Go support live comedy if you can, not just the 
big names on tour with a local comedy scene that's probably struggling to exist. Try not to heckle because it kind of ruins the show, but it's not a huge deal if you do. Definitely don't slap the performer while he's on stage. If you find something offensive or harmful, talk about it. Write articles about it, podcasts about it, tweet about it. That is all just more speech. So comedians should respect your right to do that, but they, we all know they won't. And I'd say to comedians, there's a lot more that you can do. The open mics in your city should have at least some options that aren't horrifying toxic death traps. Open mics that are women only, queer only, or have rules like no rape jokes or even no punching down are great ways to get more diversity in the scene, something it desperately needs. The first time I did one of those safe space mics, I was like, oh wow, lots of new comics here, they're probably gonna suck. And then I saw them perform and I was like, oh damn, I guess these ladies must have been performing for years. I just uh, never see them because I strictly go to open mics where everyone wants to die. Anyway, those kinds of rooms are great and it'd be cool if there were more of them. If you're a show booker, don't be afraid to ban people from your shows, even if you're running an open mic. I know it doesn't feel cool to tell somebody you don't have space on your seven hour bucket show for them even after they've spent the last few weeks diligently working out the kinks in a brand new bit, a recording of which will one day be used as evidence in an integrated domestic violence court. But you're curating a show here. Don't worry, he'll still have plenty of other mics around town where the hosts will happily allow him to incriminate himself. And please be aware that stand-up comedy's commitment to free speech makes it a great environment for fascists. I can't say for sure that your particular scene has attracted Nazis any more than I can say that the orange crush you spill between your bed and the wall has attracted ants. All I can say is that it's fairly likely. It's kind of like the punk scene. In the 70s, British punks were wearing swastikas just because they knew it would piss people off. And shortly after that, the actual Nazis showed up to hang out. Now, I don't think comedians are capable of dealing with fascists as directly as anti-fascist punks are, because punks don't really care what people think, and stand-ups are more like, I sure hope people think I'm funny enough to book me. So I'm not expecting comics to form anti-fascist collectives and hang out in comedy club parking lots, beating down anyone with a joke about dead names. If you are planning to do that, no comment. But otherwise, how about this? If there are fascists in your scene, don't book them on your shows. Is there someone in your scene who you think might be a fascist, but you're not sure? Simple solution. Listen to one episode of their podcast. They definitely have one. Comics feel safe on podcasts for some reason. They're like, I would never state my white supremacist ethnostate beliefs on stage in front of three people, but I would feel perfectly fine making a permanent digital record of them. If you do find out somebody sucks worse than you thought, I recommend you do what comes most naturally to stand-up comedians. Talk shit about them to other comics. Hey, if somebody listened to Gavin McInnes' overtly fascist show early on and talked to Rogan about it, Maybe we wouldn't have gotten the Proud Boys. Comedy is a very hierarchical workplace, so all of this goes extra for headliners. I've seen comics and even club bookers with some horrible views shut the fuck up real quick once the most successful respected comic in the room gave the slightest indication that that shit wasn't cool with them. In any case, I hope we can all stop saying that stand-up comedians are the last bastion of free speech because clearly the real final bastion is YouTube video essayists. Free speech gives me the ability to say whatever I want, no matter how disturbing and upsetting it is to my audience, and I'm going to use it. I'm going to say my most fucked up opinion, something so twisted, so inappropriate, that I'm pretty sure I'm about to piss off literally everyone who's watching. But that's the whole point of making video essays. Click away now if you don't want to get triggered. Go on, run along back to your little safe space. Still here. All right, can't say I didn't warn ya. Amy Schumer is good. <laughs> I don't give a fuck. I'll say it. Her mostly sex stuff was the best special of 2012. And yes, I'm well aware that Mulaney's New in Town came out that year too. I didn't even put her sketch show inside Amy Schumer above Key and Peele. Honestly, I love Key and Peele, but it's not close. I'm on a fucking rampage. She burned out her popularity in just a few years, alienated her original edgy bro fan base by appealing to feminists, and then alienated her feminist fan base when they found her old edgy jokes. But 
when she was at her peak, she had a string of just delightful talk show interviews. Does that offend you? Good. Fuck you. And yeah, she spread herself too thin doing four seasons of a sketch show with fresh stand-up in every episode, and then coming out with the letter special, which I acknowledge was pretty weak, but almost nobody could have kept up that pace. Does that trigger you yet? Well, chew on this. Personally, I chalk up almost all the accusations of joke theft to parallel thinking. What are you going to do about it? If any of you snowflakes in the comments have a problem with that, I will use my right to free speech to cry softly to myself while I rewatch Trainwreck. Free speech! <laughs> am, I, am I doing free speech right?